Welcome to the teaching ministry of Lifetime Guarantee. We've been presenting the message of freedom and grace in Christ for over 30 years. The legacy of the ministry spans every state in the U.S. and reaches into over 140 countries internationally. We're glad that by listening, you're joining the extended family of Lifetime Guarantee. Two things before we begin. First, after you've listened to this teaching, we encourage you to share this MP3 with your friends. Second, your financial contribution will assist us in making more of the ministry available to others. This is so important. You can make a donation at Lifetime.org. That's Lifetime.org. I need to be the head in our relationship. And that certainly doesn't mean that it's my right, but it's a need that I have. Hun, God has wired us males to where we need to be the head. It's not a big ego trip for us. We really need this. And so he has given you to me in order to partially satisfy that need yes. that I've got. Russ Kelfer, who's a friend of ours, uh, who's also a, a Bible teacher, makes this statement that we've used before, that nowhere in Scripture do we read, Husbands, see that your wife submits to you in all authority. It doesn't say that, but boy, we come across like that. I have done this in my lifetime. Come across like, look, this is my right. I have a right. It's not a right, sugar. It's a need that I have to be your authority. The scriptures say, husbands, love your wives as Christ loves the church, which is his wife, and gave himself up for her. And one of the great boons to the whole liberated women's movement has been the autocratic, unloving, insensitive clod known as the evangelical Christian husband. And boy, do I fit the mold. I have been so guilty of doing that very thing and coming across that way. The matter of submission is between a woman and God it's God's business. My job as a husband, hun, is to so love you and treasure you that you are highly motivated and drawn to me to submit to me as an authority in mm -hmm. your life. Yes. This letter out of our files is pretty typical of what I hear from a lot of husbands whose wives will not submit to their headship. Dear Bill, Patty and I have been separated now since March. We see each other about once a week, but we don't get much accomplished. From my point of view, she builds my resentment toward her by being so bossy. Seems like she's on my case all the time about how I'm failing. And I just take it and take it. Finally, before I do something I know I'm going to be sorry for, I just leave. She says she lost respect for me because I didn't make decisions. But Bill, when I did, she wouldn't go along with them unless they were identical to what she wanted. She'd either ridicule me or run me down. If it was really important, she'd lose her cool and tear up something. How are you going to win in a situation like that? Maybe I went about it in the wrong way. Maybe I was too dogmatic or something. I simply don't understand how to deal with her. I think that that letter makes it crystal clear that a husband needs to believe something about his relationship, and that is that he is the head of it. Now, sometimes when we think of that, we think of a dictatorial person. We think of a dogmatic person. We think of a threatened person who has to puff up their feathers and flex their muscles. And we see it all the time. Why, sure we do. But that is not what we're talking about. I think that one of the saddest things is for a person to have been given a job of authority but have no one respect his position and no one listen to him when he exerts that authority. You talk about a frustrating experience for a man. Our husbands need to believe that they are the head. 
But, boy, have a lot of us guys blown it by the way we've gone about trying to get our wives to submit to our authority. Uh, too often we've come through like when a male redbirds are prettier than female redbirds are, peacocks are prettier than peahens Seems are. Seems like I've heard this somewhere before. <laughs> I'm bigger than you are. I can throw a baseball straighter than you can. I can find north when I need to. And so, therefore, you just ought to recognize that I am in authority here. You ought to submit to my headship. And it goes over like a lead balloon, doesn't it? That goes over like I am a superior person Uh and you need to bow to me. And that's not it. Honey, let's put this in a realm that possibly we can understand. Let's consider the man who is the head of of a very successful firm and he has employees with various job descriptions. What will that man do in order to ensure a successful company with loyal, contented, and productive work people? What would some of his leadership responsibilities include? Now, as we discuss this, uh, let's parallel the husband okay. as the head of the home, yeah. the firm, mm-hmm. okay? Okay. One of the things that the head of the firm would do is that he would establish safe and efficient working conditions. And for me in the home, there are always little things going on around there, like a lamp cord will become frayed. And if you don't fix it, it could cause a fire and burn the house down. We had a friend just during the Christmas holidays whose Christmas tree caught on fire and burned the house down. It wasn't his fault. It was just a short in the electricity, but that's dangerous stuff. Uh, A a stepladder that's real wobbly. Uh, I need to see about such things as that because somebody could be injured by that. Keep the washer and the dryer going. If I can't fix it, then get somebody to help me or hire someone to come Mm -hmm. in. But see to it that these things are working and in order. Honey, there isn't anything that thrills a woman much more than to see her husband walk through the house with the screwdriver and the hammer in his hand, mm-hmm. knowing that he's going to be repairing the nest some way. Mm-hmm. That uh, that makes us one. That makes a common bond there. Mm-hmm. Okay. I try to carry a screwdriver around a lot. <laughs> I, I just don't use it much. <laughs> wrong, wrong, wrong. Okay, what else would the head of a firm do? He would use sound, motivational techniques and probably go to seminars to update how to deal with his people. Right, yeah. As opposed to being critical and negative and hostile toward the people around him, which Mm -hmm. I could do as a husband and a father and turn everybody off, alienate everybody. Uh, How to motivate your workforce. Then provide health care. Yeah. Some guys resist letting uh, the kids and the wife go to the doctor. They'd say, don't take him to the doctor. Now, I know a wife could overdo it, but there are guys that can overdo this by Mm -hmm. resisting taking the child to the dentist when he really needs to go. Well, he went six years ago. (laughs) (laughs) How about establishing good relationships with employees? Yeah. What does that mean? It means be a pleasant, a fun kind of person around the house. Now, some guy says, Bill, I'm just not a pleasant, fun kind of person. Now, listen, Christ is, and he's your life, and what you're discussing is just flesh. You must allow Christ through you to be pleasant through you and fun-loving and taking part in the the activities that are going on in the home. Mm -hmm. Okay, another one, to be mindful of the emotional needs of each employee. How would he do that? Just trust Christ to give you a sensitivity to the emotional needs of those around you. Now, all of us guys know that premenstrual syndrome is a fact of life. And so if you're not real sensitive to it, ask God to show you, Lord, make me sensitive to my wife's needs during this period of time so I can be extra compassionate to her. Or how about, honey, uh, rainy days, like today happens to be here in in our city, rainy days, and you're at home, and you've got a couple of preschoolers. 
What should I, what should be on my mind as I go home at the end of the day? Relief for your wife. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Here comes the, the uh, relief force in, right? Yeah, I remember a guy coming in on a day like that where there was, you know, and she just, she was so distraught, and he just took her out in the laundry room and closed the door and just held her for about five minutes. And then he said to her, now, we're going to get these kids fed, we're going to call in a babysitter, and you and I are going to go out and get a hamburger. What beautiful words. <laughs> Okay, another one. Provide vacation time. If he doesn't provide vacation time, his employees are going to burn out. Mm -hmm. And not many guys can take their wives off for a week or two weeks in the middle of the, uh, you know, with the preschool kids there because it's so expensive to hire somebody to stay with the kids. But, hon, just a night out like I just described with that man coming home. Uh Uh-huh. How about to be a consistent leader of integrity and fair treatment? Honey, what would happen if a husband would incorporate these things into being the head of the home? Through Christ, this can be done, and his kids and his wife will follow his leadership. They'll admire him. They'll praise him. They'll be proud of him, and he'll be able to transfer his faith to them. He'll be able to build a home on the Lord Jesus Christ. And this sign that a lot of guys have on their door, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord, it'll become very obvious in the very lives of his family members. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have a teacher who really loved you and believed in you and communicated that to you with her words or eyes and so forth? How'd that affect you? Ever have a teacher like that, Mm -hmm. huh? How'd that affect you? Oh, you wanted to die for her. You looked forward to being with her. She was a pleasant person, and you just anticipated her class. Yeah, or if it was a man, same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, would he never need to demand or manipulate or threaten you in any way to get you to uh, clean up your act and, and follow his teaching, would he? No, she. all he would need to say is, you can do it, and I'm proud of you. So a general desire pervaded the classroom, a desire to do the very best possible Mm -hmm. in this class because of the love, responding to the love of that teacher. Now, this is the way God wants me as a father and as a husband to come across in my home. I'm not saying to you that I always come across that way, but as I allow Christ to live through me, As the head of the home, that is the kind of attitude that is going to more and more pervade my home. Mm -hmm. And talking, honey, about the husband's leadership, I agree with you. If the husband, in his role as head, doesn't demand like some fanatical autocrat, you are supposed to submit to my authority. You do as I say. You do not question the decisions that I set forth, or etc., but rather fulfills his responsibilities as a leader of the family, then the same thing's going to happen. There's going to be compatibility, unity, loyalty, partnership, and respect from his wife. Yeah. And so that then sets me up to present Jesus Christ to my family, not just as words, but as life. They'll be able to detect Christ in and through me. And I am the one who is to communicate Christ to my family primarily as as the head, as the male. Now, this is completely contrary to the way a lot of Christian dads perceive their roles. Some guys believe that religion ought to be the wife's responsibility. Right. You know, my job is to teach the boys how to hunt and fish and the rules of the football game, etc. Wrong song, man. My role is that, yeah, but it's also to show them Jesus Christ through my lifestyle. Mm -hmm. Honey, you made a statement that you are the one who presents Christ to your family. Have you ever considered the fact that you as the husband are indeed the priest, that you are the prophet, Mm -hmm. and that 
as a priest and as a prophet, or the priest and the prophet, I should say, that you have certain responsibilities. Yeah, now what is a priest? A priest is the intercessor to God on behalf of the people. Okay, well, who are my people? Mm -hmm. My family. Mm -hmm. Now, what's a prophet? Well, the prophet explains or represents God to his people. Again, to my family. And this describes then a husband and a dad. Uh I'm a priest and a prophet. Right. A scripture comes to mind there, Sugar. Noah... Uh, In Genesis chapter 7, verse 1, the Lord said to Noah, Enter the ark, you and all your household, for you alone I have seen to be righteous before me in this time. So the righteousness of Noah was the reason that his whole family was seen by God as able to enter into the ark for salvation, yeah, right? Yeah, and a, a similar scripture in the New Testament, Acts 16, 31. Uh, this is the Philippian jailer. And they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you shall be saved, you and your household. Now, that's a pretty special verse to you. It isn't really it? is. Uh, mm-hmm. Mike, years ago when I got saved, I was watching Billy Graham on the tube. He used that verse And that's the verse that God used to bring me to Jesus Christ. And I want to take a little side trip here to just say something about that because I think my testimony is a common testimony that a lot of people can identify with in that getting saved did not give me any kind of a big emotional experience, no big emotional high as a result of it. I centered in on that verse. I asked people about it. People told me how they got saved, and it wasn't uncommon for them to say that there was a great euphoria. One dear lady even told me about, um, and I don't doubt her, uh, she meant well. God deals with all of us differently. That's right, and she meant well by sharing this with me, and I praise God for it. But she said she floated down the aisle when she got saved, and she had... uh, no memory of, of uh, being ambulatory, you know, going down the aisle. She said that the preacher's shirt seemed to be silver. The lights in the auditorium turned to gold. Well, hallelujah. That's beautiful. <laughs> That's, something. That's beautiful. Yeah, I, I would never have another doubt if I had had an experience like that. And, and God gave that to her, and that's wonderful. But in my case, I couldn't get the bells to ring. I couldn't get the preacher's shirt to turn to silver. And I so wanted some tangible evidence. Well, I finally just knelt down by my bed after struggling this with this for several days. And I said, God, I just, I believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know how to believe any harder. What do I do? Strain? I don't know how to believe any harder. So, God, if I die tonight and go to hell, I'm going to go to hell believing. And I just finished it, and I got up and went to bed, believing. And then, as the days progressed, I began to see change coming into my life, which validated that, indeed, something had happened to me back there. Mm -hmm. Well, I really dread, I I just shudder. I was thinking just last night, hon, what would my family situation be like had that salvation not happened had that salvation not visited our house uh, years and years ago Mm -hmm. i just shudder to think where we'd be today but that promise has come true in your life it has come true because of of my faith and the kids being able to look at my walk with christ and because of your faith and they're looking at your walk with jesus they have caught the vision and they have all become saved as well. Mm-hmm. So the promise is to the husband and the wife as well as the house, but the house has to choose to accept Christ as Savior. Mm-hmm. I hear you saying, though, that the primary responsibility is the dad's. Yes. Um, a child's understanding, interpretation of God comes from his daddy. They get their idea of a heavenly father from their earthly daddy, yeah. don't they? Yeah. 
Now, just because I was created by our Father to be the head, hon, that doesn't mean that I'm any better than you are. No. It's just that we were created with different roles to life out on the planet. And, and God has designed us so you and I are to fit together as one. And to do that, we got to have different needs so we can mesh together, right? Mm -hmm. And you know it has taken the sting out of submitting to you as my head by seeing in Scripture that I am your equal. It's not a matter of superiority, inferiority. Mm -mm. It's a matter of roles. Yeah. And you and I are equal. Our relationship is the same as Jesus' relationship to the Father. Jesus is the Father's equal. It tells us that in Philippians 2, 6. But he totally submits to the Father's authority over him, mm -hmm. 1 Corinthians 15, 28. They're equal, but they each have different roles in their relationship. And some wives choose to resist their God-ordained role and try to take over their husband's role. Try to control. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's going to mess things up. Here's a letter we got from a fella. He says, um, it's a vicious circle. Janice runs the house, but she doesn't really want to. It's impossible for me to satisfy her. Her need for precision and order is just never ending, it seems. And my ability to perform at every level is inconsistent, according to her standards. So she then believes that our relationship is unbalanced and doesn't feel capable of giving me the things that I desperately need at that particular time. Well, then I start to feel rejected and unacceptable to her as a husband and a father, and I wind up seeking acceptance somewhere else in the arms of another woman. And, Bill, I hate it. I despise it but I simply don't know how to get out of this awful mess. Home to a lot of men means insecurity. It means a place where I'm threatened in my role. It means um, failure, a bedlam, or hostility. It means pressure. It means uh, rejection of what they say, rejection of who they are, rejection of what they do, and the role that we as wives play in our husband's images of home just cannot be overemphasized. That's right. That's right. I can either be excited about coming home as a husband, or I can say, oh, well, I've got to leave my work that I enjoy, and now I've got to go home and put up with that situation that I live with. It can be one or the other, or obviously it can be somewhere in the middle. Now, in our home, we've had this struggle, doll, with uh, authority and submission to my headship. Now, I could tell a lot of anecdotes, but I'll tell this one. You know, as a kid, I was reared in a home with a passive dad and a real strong mom, and it affected my masculinity. It, I grew up as a threatened male, insecure in my masculinity because I could never see myself catching up to and surpassing uh, the strength of the female. And so consequently, uh, I have struggled through this. This is what the Bible would call my flesh. Now, I took a couple of years of shop in high school because the coach was the uh, shop teacher and all the athletes enrolled in there. And in two years' time, I made a billy club and a little gun rack. Great talent. So, and so not too <laughs> swift. So I hung it up after uh, high school and never touched woodworking again. Now, years went by, and somewhere in my 30s, all of a sudden, I just knew that I could do woodwork. I could see it in my head. You know, it's just maturity is what it is. Weren't we in Springfield uh, when, that, when no, that started? No, it was way before that. Was it? So I went down and got a saber saw and some wood and stuff and started whipping out a wooden shelf. And I hung it up on the wall and stained, you know, stained it in reverse order. And then uh, Annabelle put her little doodaddies up there on it. Friends would come over, and she'd say, look what my smart husband did. 
and I'd try to act cool. But I was loving this. It was this is a masculine task, and it built up my masculinity, made me feel better about my rela- my my role in you know in, in life really. Really, our whole neighborhood had shelves. <laughs> <laughs> so I became a prolific shelf maker. Yeah, I scattered them around, man. If you come to see us, why well, they're all over our house. Well, I wore that deal out because it's just a flesh trip, and you can't satisfy the flesh. So I finally wore out on making shelves and retired. Well, then Annabelle came to me some years later, and she said, Honey, I need you to make me another shelf for the boys' room. Well, I ignored her, and uh, um, I'd already done that, right, Doll? Mm -hmm. I didn't hear you saying, Love me again, Bill, by making me a shelf. I heard you saying, make me a shelf, and I'd already done that. So I just ignored you. Well, weeks went by, and you present the need again, and I ignored it again. And this kept going on until finally one day I came home from work, and Annabelle took me by the hand and said, have I got a surprise for you. And she led me back into the boy's bedroom, and there on the wall is this new shelf that Annabelle has made and it looks as good as my shelves do. And, hunt something died inside me when I saw that shelf. I don't remember what I said or what I did. I didn't understand it at the time, but years later, when I was counseling with a couple, God brought it back to my memory, and I understood what happened to me. When I saw that shelf... It made me feel unnecessary. It made me feel like Annabelle can get along just as well without me as with me. You were usurping my role, sugar. Mm -hmm. We both see that now, don't we? Right. Let me ask you a question that comes to mind as you tell that story, honey. What if your son had been observing you make all of those shelves? In fact, he had helped you make them. And you come home from school one day, and he says, Boy, Dad, do I ever have a surprise for you. And he takes you back to the bedroom, and there on the wall is a shelf that he has made, Mm. and it looks almost as good as yours. What's your reaction going to be? Oh, pride. Uh, I've been been proud of him. Uh, He's an extension of me. This is my son. Look what he did. So it wouldn't have been threatening to me. But when you made the shelf, then that put you in competition with me in my role, and that was a threat to me. We got to understand now as we're we're lecturing here that we're dealing with a man who who has insecure flesh. My, My fleshly patterning is to be insecure as a male and always having to prove myself. And so God gives me victory over that through Christ and through my new identity in Christ. But your number is legion, honey. Oh, yeah. There are millions of us Mm -hmm. guys like that. But now let me ask you a question as a woman, as a wife. When you came to Christ and you were crucified with him, you were buried with him, and you were raised up as a brand new creature... Did he raise up a woman who was, as Bill says, strong as an acre of garlic? No, no. He raised up a woman with the desire deep in her heart to be everything her husband desires her to be, everything that God has told her to be. Your strength, your assertiveness, your capability that threatens your husband, those are flesh patterns that were burned into you during your years here on planet earth they are not the real you now and they do not need to control you any longer if if you're listening and you're my sister in christ and you have not let's just say you're not a contender for having done this the best in the whole country you know as a submission to your husband (laughs) but rather as a child growing up you learn just the opposite you you patterned yourself for strength and aggressiveness and assertiveness and through grade school uh, you uh, you were a strong gal and you could dominate the boys in many cases and um, then you get saved 
and now then you're a, an adult female wife and godly Christian woman in Christ. But you have this tremendous uh, assertive behavior that comes out of you. And Annabelle and I believe without question that this has to be flesh. We trace it all the way back to what I just described. So when you got saved, these patterns for assertiveness and aggressiveness then became your old pre-Christ ways. And now, the Bible calls that flesh. I always kind of uh, start feeling uncomfortable when you box all strength, all female strength, into assertive and aggressive. Mm. Now, I was a very strong person. I was patterned for strength, but I was not an assertive and I was not an aggressive person, mm. and I did not try to dominate you. I was just a very capable, strong woman. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, of course, influenced and interfered in our relationship as much as a domineering, aggressive, assertive female would because there's still the strength there. But let's not box all, fe all strong females into being domineering, outspoken, assertive, uh, aggressive people. Yeah, that's a good word. Okay, now, if you are, if you have the kind of flesh that we're describing today, ma'am, Chances are you are married to a man either with passive flesh or a man with macho flesh. Chances are you are not married to a man who is stronger than you. Now, if you identify with being married to the man with the passive flesh, and let's say you're 15, 20 years into the marriage, then for years your prayer has been, Lord, do something to this man. Get him off the dime. Get him involved in this marriage. He just, he works hard. He brings his check home. He doesn't ever cause any problems like that. But the problem is he just will not stand up and be counted and, and help me be a parent in this relationship. He just sits over there with his white hat on and never really gets involved in making the decisions and the dirty work and these kinds of things that have to be done. On the other hand, if, you're, if you identify more with being married to the guy with the macho flesh, then it won't have been a quiet, passive environment. Chances are it will have been a hot war. There may have been affairs. He may have humiliated you and embarrassed you by uh, criticizing you saying hateful things to you uh, at the doctor's office, at the Thanksgiving dinner table in front of your mom and dad and all your relatives, constantly warring against you, trying to chop you off at the knees. The dynamic of this is so he can feel more male and more in control in the relationship. Now, how do I know this? Because this latter marriage that I've described has been more of what you and I have experienced. And although, right. as you pointed out, you were not done. Uh, you were not um, what's aggressive the word? and domineering. Domineering, yeah, that's the word I'm searching for. You weren't that at all. But the other, the ability and and the um, energy to life out your role in the marriage plus about half of mine, which always made me play in catch-up ball. Mm -hmm. Now then, let me qualify what we're saying. Remember, we are addressing the person, the woman, who has become a Christian and now who has strong female flesh. And if you have that, then... In all probability, you are married to either a passive male or a threatened macho male. Now, if you are married to a threatened macho male, don't compete with him. Don't constantly defeat him in games like ping pong and badminton and uh, croquet. He'll start doing something that you find very offensive, like uh, winter camping up above the timberline where you freeze to death, he will be forced to try to do something macho that you can't do. Don't constantly uh, defeat him in card games like bridge and pitch in front of your friends or 
he'll do something else. He'll take up something that he can do by himself where he won't be in an area where he's competing with you. Now, look, your husband will enjoy a challenge, but he does not enjoy continuous defeat. What goes on in the emotions of a man who experiences this continuous defeat from his wife? Well, he has this built-in need to be the head. So if he can never successfully experience that, and instead he's, he experiences the opposite. He, he wants to be that, but he, he just gets frustrated. He's met with constant failure. Feels uncomfortable. He begins to feel uncomfortable. He begins to feel insecure. Now, let's put him in that environment for 15 or 20 years and then trot uh, the secretary by who constantly defers to him, who looks up to him and says, my, you do things well. Uh, don't you see what's going to begin to happen in this man? I, I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to you who are listening. Can you see that it's going to set your husband up for the devil to blindside him. He won't realize what happened. He may verbalize it to you. Well, I, I just fell out of love with you. Somewhere along the line, we lost it, and I fell out of love with you. And, and I have fallen in love with Susie over here. I really believe this is the woman that I've been looking for all my life. I have never been happy with you. I finally have found true happiness. What's happened to the guy is he is getting fulfilled. He has found frustration with one woman. He has found fulfillment with the second woman. And he calls this love. But really, what, what's happening to him? It's just the frustration and fulfillment that you've already mentioned. So he's getting his male needs met, and he calls it love. A husband needs to be the head. It's a need that I have. I love the title of our chapter in our book that we're discussing today, a male's need, not his right. Mm -hmm. It isn't that I have a right to be the head, therefore you submit to me. That's not it at all. It's that I have a need to be the head, therefore please submit to me and don't fight me for this role that God has ordained me to life out. Now, Annabelle and I have come to believe that if you are a lady who has strong flesh, and you're married to a guy who has threatened male flesh, probably macho flesh, where he's constantly trying to prove to himself his masculinity. One of the worst things you can do is compete with him. And the thing that breaks our heart is when we see this happening in Christianity, where a wife, not meaning to, is competing against her husband as a Christian. What I mean by that? I mean, you go to two or three Bible studies a week, and uh, you spend a lot of time at the church, and you leave uh, Bibles open with markings in them so your husband can find them. You mean well. You really mean well. You want him to catch what you have, but he views it as competition, and his his attitude is, I am not going to get into another arena where she's going to beat me to death, where she's in a, in a Mercedes loaded with gas, is the way I say it, and where I'm just getting on a bicycle back here at the starting gate. If I ever do find Christ and get saved, I, I, I may not even come out and declare that because I don't want to compare myself with you in yet another arena and feel like I'm just way back there dragging the tail. And I guess one of the best ways to communicate this point is to allow a wife who has experienced it uh, to talk to us about it. So the following letter is from a friend, and it's uh, a dramatic illustration of this type of marriage and its subsequent results. 
where this dear person was transferred against her will to that group that we very that we call very poignantly single again. She says, Dear Annabelle, do we ever fit the former Gillum family portrait? What an unbelievable mess. Hell on earth created so quietly under a roof in a house that appeared to be a home to the world looking in. One of our biggies has been competition. I have beaten him in every physical activity we have ever participated in. I took up bicycling a couple of years ago, worked at it diligently. A 200-mile ride in two days was a recreational trek, and I'd think he was a real cream puff because he couldn't whip off 25 miles just to stroll for me without being worn out. Tennis? Oh, yes, I could wipe him off the court. I practiced diligently. I took lessons and had a lot of natural ability. I couldn't wait to get him on the court and show him just how good I was. Last year, we got a 25-foot sailboat. He had dreamed of this boat and spent months reading how to maneuver and sail it. You know, it takes a bit of expertise to put it in the slip without scraping the sides or bumping the bow. Well, guess who qualified as the expert? First try. I did do one thing smart, Annabelle. I never tried to sail it while he was on board. Oh, I've really proven myself in many areas. Unfortunately, none of them encouraged my husband to want to spend any fun time with me. Oh, how sad. These are dear, dear Christian people. Well, we went to see him as quickly as we could, went to see her first and talked with her. And you can tell by Annabelle's letter that she really was heartbroken. She saw that she had made a terrible mistake, but she could no longer, there was no channel of communication for her anymore. And so then we went to see him. He lived across town somewhere, and uh, we didn't know quite how to get there, so we met him at a designated parking lot. Uh, he met us in his Porsche, a uh, successful businessman. And um, he drove us to his very nice bachelor pad. He um, took off his coat, and loosened his tie, and offered us some refreshment. And we began to talk, and we began to share with him uh, about what had happened and how God could turn this whole thing around, and he just needed to give God a chance to do this. And um, he listened very attentively. He was very kind to us. We're we're friends. But finally he said, you know, I I just really do appreciate you all coming over. I know that you love us, and uh, I know you mean well. But I have no intention of getting back into the marriage, no intention at all. And then he kind of paused, and he got a kind of a faraway look in his eye, and so Annabelle and I sat and waited to see what he was going to say. And he said these words that I'll never forget. He said, But if I ever should get back into the marriage, I'd win next time. How heartbreaking, huh? Competing. Now... Competition usually climaxes with trophies or prizes. And competition in a marriage has some trophies, too. Uh, The list includes divorce, insecurity, loneliness, financial hardships, radical adjustments to life, and children who have literally had their love objects ripped away from them. Why are we competing? And do we really want the prizes that we're going to get if we should win? Goodness me, the people that we talk to. I talked to a young woman just the other day who had been married for 18 years, and it ended in divorce. Her children chose to live with their dad, so they're taken away. 
She had to move out of her home and now lives in a one-bedroom apartment, and she's working two jobs. Oh, my goodness, uh, the prizes of competing in a marriage. So many stories from real people. I remember the conference we went to, um, one of the most attractive couples that I've really ever met wound up uh, sitting with us in a very relaxed um, atmosphere, and we were just talking. And I better say that we were not the speakers at this conference. No, we were just attending Mm -hmm. as conferees. They talked about their business uh, engagements. Uh, She was a very successful businesswoman. He was a very successful businessman. She talked about her assets. He talked about his assets. She talked about going to market and uh, the women's fashions that were the latest things. He talked about going to market and the men's fashions that were the very latest. Uh, It just seemed like they complemented each other. Mm -hmm. Had Uh, so much in common. Oh, yeah. He talked about his clients, and they would laugh, and then she would share about her clients. One morning uh, before the conference ended, there was a knock at our door. And it was the husband. So we asked him in. And uh, before we could start any small talk, he just blurted out, I'm leaving my wife. Well, of course, Bill and I looked at each other with our mouths open, and, and then we said, what in the world are you talking about? And I guess we've heard this answer given in many different ways, but it always comes across the same way. His answer was this, Mary doesn't need me. She'll do just fine without me. I have found a woman who needs me. I need that as a husband. I need to feel like you need me. And in our relationship, we began to see that that this was also true in our relationship, that because of your self-sufficiency, it began to come across to me you can get along just as well without me as you can with me. It was such a subtle thing. I could not articulate it. It was a feeling that I had down inside. And God began to show us this after several years about how to trust Christ to do the things that we talk about in this radio program, how to trust Him to turn this thing around and turn our roles back around and get the ship back going the direction that that God wanted it to be going. Mm -hmm. Well, I remember another fellow, and this is not uncommon, um, who had a marriage relationship where his wife was much more competent and capable in the relationship than he was. And she managed all the funds, and she would give him money for spending money each week. Uh, If he wanted to get a sport coat or something, he had to come and talk with her, and then if she okayed it, she would give him the money, and he would go get the coat. Now, sure, couples ought to discuss their purchase together. I'm not talking about that, but I'm saying, don't you see, that, that he was in the role of a little boy, kind of, and his wife was in the role of mother. Now, after 12, 15 years of marriage, the marriage finally broke up, These are two Christians now. I was talking with him one day. He was remarried to another gal who was uh, several years younger than he. And he said that in the relationship, he and his new wife would just go out, and if, if he wanted to buy a new shotgun, he just bought it. He said, hey, I'd like the new shotgun. And she said, great, buy the shotgun. And so he did. And they just bought everything. And finally, he began to get the idea, whoa, wait a minute, this thing's out of control. We're just spending our money like water, and we're not being diligent with our money. And so he sat down then and worked out a plan whereby he would take control of the finances. Now, this is a tragic story to me. The man would say, it's wonderful that I'm in this new marriage, and I'm beginning to be the man that I really want to be. But God's plan was that all of this we've been discussing is flesh, and they were to come to the end of that and claim Christ as life 
and begin to turn it around in the marriage to the glory of God. But now they've got two different marriages and some children that have grown up in a broken home. And there is absolutely no need for it if Christians will understand how to claim our true identity in Christ and begin to let Christ live through us to life out our true roles in our marriages. Mm -hmm. Let's go ahead now and talk about the decision-making process. This seems to be an area of great discussion, or should I say great dissension. I've had some pretty difficult struggles with this, especially when I would see you making a decision for the family that I felt strongly was not the right decision. So um, let's share how we have solved this problem and how the Lord has made you sensitive to my role in this aspect of our relationship. So let's say that we have a decision to make on should we plant a big garden this spring. Okay. Now, as a male, I would typically approach this logically. With cause and effect. Yeah. Here are the seven reasons why we ought to plant a big garden. Mm -hmm. Whereas a female will typically approach it more intuitively, meaning... I just don't feel like this is the year we ought to plant a big garden, but unable to come up with seven or eight logical steps leading to your conclusion. Right. Now, for years, I plead guilty. I saw that as illogical, only I didn't call it that. I called <laughs> it stupid. Right. Now, it's not stupid, and it's, it, it's just different. And, and brother... If I just run roughshod over Annabelle making decisions for the family without getting her input, then I'm cutting my nose off to spite my face. I am cutting myself off from the main source of intuitive input, i.e. Annabelle, that God has given me, that God has given me for solving problems in the family. So it'll be amazing, brother, if you will humble yourself and explain your problems to your wife and ask her for her insight and her input. I don't care if you're a computer technician and your wife knows Zippo about them. Lay these things out before her and ask her her opinion about some of these things. I was reading an article not too long ago where they took a poll of uh, about 205 small business owners and ask them what their main source of input in their business was. And, uh, oh, like 50% of them mentioned their banker, and 46% uh, of them mentioned magazines. But 61% of them mentioned among the top ones their wife, that they did uh, consult their wife about their problems, business hmm. problems. I hmm. thought that was wonderful. Yeah, that is. That's really neat. Okay, back to the garden thing then. So let's say that we talk this over now, and um, then finally I come to the conclusion after praying about it, because it's a biggie deal, so I'm going to pray about it, and I say, well, I really believe the Lord is saying, I want you to plant the garden. So when I make this decision, now what do I not need from you? Well, be before I answer your question, I want to clarify a point, and that is that as we discussed the issue, this very important issue, that you listened to my input, yeah. okay? Yeah. And that doesn't mean that you had the seed catalog out with your pencil in hand, jotting down the different kinds of seed and just turning one ear to me uh, as I was talking, Okay? Yeah. That means eye contact and questions, right? Right, yeah. Okay, so that, that's very important that you listen to my input. Okay, now then, you come to me and you say uh, that you've thought about it, you've prayed about it, and you've come to this decision that we are going to plant the garden. Mm -hmm. And what do you not need from me? You do not need me to say something like this to you. Uh, well, that's... Um, that's very strange because, you see, I prayed about it, too, and uh, that's not the answer that the Lord gave me. Mm. Cut me off at the knees. Right. I don't need that. <laughs> <laughs> now, what do I need when I come to you like this? What do I need, what do I need from you? You need me to say something like, fine, um, 
do you have a few minutes um, before you go to work where we could decide what we're going to plant and maybe I could run down to the hardware store this afternoon and get the seed? Oh, I love it. I love it. All right, so let's say we go ahead and plant the garden. Mm -hmm. And two months later, after one of the worst droughts in the history of Texas, gardens burned up. And we're sitting around the breakfast table. Let's make it years ago, and let's make the boys small. They're all around the table. And the guy comes on the radio and says, Well, folks, another week of hot, dry weather. There's no hope for any rain. What do I not need from you in this situation? Well, you do not need me to say something like this, where it could be very overt, where it could be very cruel, where I could say something like... uh, You know, with the money that we spent on that little garden project that you insisted on undertaking, I could have bought vegetables for years to come and have canning sitting on the shelf. Did you ever blow that? Mm. Or it could be covert, but the results would be the same, where uh, there's just silence there at the table after the music comes on, and uh, I could just uh, very quietly say... um, What was the weather forecast? I didn't get it. Mm. Now, if I had, according to the kind of flesh I've got, the power of sin is going to feed thoughts into my mind with first person singular pronouns. So let's say I've got passive flesh. The thoughts I'd get from that power as it wars against my mind, this is Romans 7 23, is. Oh, if only I had never planted that garden. I knew I shouldn't have tried it. I knew it, and so forth, trying to intimidate me into backing out of my role. If I've got macho flesh, the thoughts coming to me will be to roll over you and put you in your place so I can reestablish my authority in the home, both of which are flesh positions. Brother, you don't have to live like that. You can claim Christ as life and overcome that. Ma'am, you can do the same thing. And what do I need coming from you? Well, you need me to say something like, uh, don't worry about that silly garden. Uh, I can go down to the farmer's market and buy the veggies. Uh, We thought we were doing the right thing. We, we, we. Did you all hear those pronouns? Oh, I tell you, wife, if you'll treat me like that as your husband... It'll just make me want to carry you around on a silver platter. But how can I carry you around on a platter if you won't get on the plate and stay there? To help in your understanding of the principles we've presented thus far, we now want to address some questions concerning this topic of meeting the needs of a husband. Joining in the roundtable format is the executive vice president of our ministry, Preston Gillum. Here's our first question today, and uh, I believe this one was submitted by Annabelle, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Well, you'll understand why I said that when you hear our question. I find it very difficult to understand why I should praise a husband who does not deserve praise. Any way you cut it, that's being deceitful. He knows it, the kids know it, and I know it. He's a loser as a husband, as a father, and as a man, and he has no desire to change. He says he's a Christian, which makes me want to deny that I am. Bitter? Yes, very. What is your answer? And Middleton, it's been nice having you on the staff. (laughs) (laughs) I'll see you all later. (laughs) Well, first of all, Mike, and I'd like to start on that one, I just want to uh, communicate to this person that I am so very, very sorry for the circumstances in which you find yourself and uh, for the marriages that are so far uh, below what God intended them to be and what we always dreamed and hoped they would be. I am so very, very sorry for that. But you ask, what can I do? Oh, you must guard yourself. The first thing you must do is guard yourself. Don't get bitter. Don't let this circumstance ruin your relationship with the one who loves you more than any earthly husband could ever love you. That's the very most important thing. The next thing that I want to suggest is this, that, that God works with individuals. Yes, he may use something in my husband's life 
and I will be a part of that because we're one. But initially, he works with individuals. So he does not hold you responsible for your husband's poor performance. Right. But he does not hold your husband responsible for your performance either. He says, wife, this is what I want you to do. God says, wife, this is what I want you to do. He does not put on there if your husband deserves it, if your husband is nice to you. What you must do is to be at peace with yourself that you are being obedient. And, uh, of course, try to keep the line of communication open and try to understand that your husband was not born a loser. Uh, he was fashioned into a loser by his unique world environment and by his reaction to that environment. But he is now responsible for his behavior. That's right. And, you know, I would throw in here too, Mom, that that I think it would be uh, wise for her to begin praying about something that she can do to get hubby's attention because part of love and submission and all of these things that we talk about on this program uh, you know where it really comes home is when you say boy this is going to require some some tough love here and in this case something to get your husband's attention to let him know that he is blowing it 16 different ways from Sunday and obviously it would be silly of us to begin trying to talk about what all that could be yes. over the air here. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think that it would be wise for you to get some counsel in this situation. And if you don't know someone who you have confidence in as a, as a counselor who will give you good, sound, biblical counsel, then give our office a call and we'll do our best to refer you to someone who can help you pray through and determine how to go about uh, giving the Lord, giving the Holy Spirit an avenue, a foothold into your husband's life where he can begin to work on him and bring about some change here. Yes. You know, uh, I was kidding at the beginning about uh, Annabelle having written this question. But coward, you know, coward, well, <laughs> retraction. That's right. <laughs> no, the fact of the matter is we were all losers without Christ, Boy, weren't we? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, yeah. I would just say to this woman that she needs to try to see her husband, if indeed he is a Christian, through God's eyes yeah. and look at him the same way God does. Yeah. And that is if he's a believer, he's holy, righteous, and forgiven. That's right. All right, let's move on to our next question. It comes from an individual who says, My wife would rather cut her tongue out than praise me. I used to have some motivation. I don't claim to have ever been an A1 husband, but at least there was some desire there. She's pretty well washed that out, though. She isn't critical. She's quiet. But I figure if she felt that I was doing something right, she could say something nice. What would you suggest for me to do? Mike, I'd encourage this fellow to begin talking with his wife about this to uh, try to describe for her exactly what's going on inside you. You know, um, this quietness, I mean, you've pegged that really well. That can be a real trip. And just, if I could, a bit of a personal testimony here, I tend to be kind of a quiet person. Uh, now, you know, when you meet me for the first time, you'll think that, that I'm very conversational and so on. But when I get by myself or with someone that I'm comfortable with, I can be fairly quiet too. Mm -hmm. And I have had to come to grips with the fact that that quietness combined with the fact that my flesh has been successful. I've been a successful performer. And that quietness combined with my competency is used by the enemy to... Uh, deceive the people who I'm around into thinking that, that I look down on them or that I don't approve of them or whatever. And just going on a hunch here, I'm guessing that maybe some of this is going on between you and your wife. She's, she's quiet. She doesn't praise you. She doesn't give you any feedback. Perhaps she is uh, a fairly competent, capable person, at which point the, the enemy can come to you and say, I know what she's thinking, mm -hmm. and she's thinking that I'm no good. She's thinking that I can't do what I need to do to fulfill her, to be the husband that I need to be, and so on. And you can see how this 
all begins to go around like one of those little hamster cages runs around in there, and you get nowhere except further in the hole. Mm -hmm. So I would encourage you that you need to talk with your wife, not not necessarily at, in the middle of a flap, you know, right after she has failed to praise you and you think she should have, but uh, over dinner or something or just a quiet evening at home. When you're just having a heart-to-heart, -heart, then bring up the subject and say, babe, here's something that, that I'd like to bring up and, and tell you about that I need and uh, a way that I think we can improve some things here and throw it out on the table there and talk with her about it and so on. And I think that that would be a good step on taking something right now that is intangible and that is hitting you from your backside and getting it on the table to where it is tangible, to where you can deal with it and talk about it and see it for what it is and come up with some solutions and so on. Mm -hmm. You know, I think if there's one thing that I would urge newlyweds to do and couples that are having problems... It would be to communicate, talk to each other. Don't let it smolder inside and build. Here's our uh, next question. You said that the husband was the priest and the prophet in the marriage. I didn't understand your line of thinking on that. Would you please elaborate with some scriptural basis? Uh, yeah, Genesis 18:19, where God is speaking about Abraham, he says, For I have chosen Abraham to command his children to keep the way of the Lord. And there are all kinds of verses that talk about the responsibility of the dad to lead his family in godliness. A priest represents people to God. He intercedes in prayer to God on their behalf. And this is what I'm to do with my family. Like last night, for example, I sat down with Wade, who's looking for work, and I put my arm on his shoulder and, uh, and prayed with him as he was there looking at the want ads. Uh, and then silently later on, I prayed for all of my kids and my wife. And in this, this morning did the same thing. A prophet, on the other hand, represents God or presents God to the people. So my role in my house then is to do this with my family, to keep Jesus Christ before them. And I think there's an interesting verse in Ephesians chapter uh, 5, verses 1 and 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children, and walk in love just as Christ also loved you and gave himself up for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God as a fragrant aroma. Now coupling that, over with 2 Corinthians chapter 2, beginning with verse 11. Just as you know how we were exhorting and encouraging and imploring each, each one of you as a father would his own children so that you may walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his kingdom and glory. By the way, that was Thessalonians, I believe, there, that oh. you were first Thessalonians. Yeah. yeah, okay. So what I'm saying then is this. How are my kids going to react to me if they don't see godliness in my life and I'm trying to lead them in godliness? Well, you're a, you were there, Charlie. That's right, Dad. I mean, <laughs> you know, it, it, and it's going to be tough for this to happen if you're not if you don't have this this person to imitate, this mentor in a sense. In fact, if you look at that word in the original language, that's where we get our word for mimic is that we mimic and, and follow after the person that, that we see lifing this out in front of us. And the home is where that ideally is supposed to occur. That's right. So a kid has to know that he is loved, and then he'll be highly motivated to mimic, as you say, to imitate that role model that is set before him. And ultimately the father himself. That's right. Okay, here's our next question. This listener says, My family glossed over all our problems. I never heard my parents argue, but it was so obvious that Mom covered up for Dad. I really lost respect for him when I became an adult because I could see that he was the leader only because Mom let him be. This has created problems for all of the children in our family. Is this the right way? Certainly not, Mike. I mean, there's nothing uh, godly about this at all. Christianity and, and God's plan is laid out in the Bible are not 
calls toward the lifestyle of an ostrich. I mean, that is not what Christianity is all about at all. We are to be a people who address life in a relevant, upfront, eyes open type of a manner. And the idea here that uh, that was perpetrated somewhere along the line that submission means that I cover up and I don't confront and I don't address the flesh that my husband has, I see as being completely in error. Now then, I don't know that there really is any hope for mom and dad changing at this point, but the fact that you and your brothers or sisters have have noticed this problem and have become aware of it does say that you guys cannot and should not repeat the same mistake that your folks made because indeed as you've assessed they were in error and you guys should not repeat that error at all because then your kids are going to be stuck with having to try to assess what is the truth here how is this thing supposed to really operate Mm -hmm. you know i would suspect that the mom in this circumstance thought she was doing her family a big favor probably so yeah you know covering up the problems Mm -hmm. and watching out for old dad but the kids you know almost intuitively I suspect, uh, or maybe not intuitively, just by observing the circumstances, saw that dad wasn't fulfilling the role that he needed to, Mm -hmm. and uh, something needed to happen to uh, create a change, not just uh, gloss it over so that it wasn't dealt with. That's true, and the real trap would be to go back and become... uh Uh, angry or frustrated or bitter even perhaps at this situation and miss the importance of dealing with it right now and not repeating the mistake. I agree um, with what you all are saying, but I also think, and I think you all would agree, that uh, it's important to preserve dad's or mom's image, but we can discuss the bad behavior, and uh, this can be done in an ethical way. Uh, obviously, the wife shouldn't go around always pointing. Every day she points out something that dad is doing wrong. But from time to time, we've got to discuss, like you said, Press, we've got to deal with flesh uh, that that manifests itself in bad behavior. The way we tried to do this with our own kids at home was that um, we taught our children that they respect a position like a teacher. Uh, sometimes the teacher will make some mistakes, and uh, we would discuss this at home, but the bottom line was you are to submit to this teacher's authority because this teacher is in authority. I think it's really interesting to see in Scripture that uh, what, a, what a big thing authority is to God. Remember the Scriptures say, about speaking about authority, it does not wear the sword for nothing. It doesn't say he doesn't wear the sword for nothing, talking about a policeman, but it does not wear the sword for nothing or in vain or something like that. I view that as God speaking of authority as an it. it, it you submit to that authority. Uh, and maybe it's coming from a person who doesn't merit it, in your opinion. But nevertheless, you lay that aside and you submit to the authority. We hope you've been encouraged by the teaching ministry of Lifetime Guarantee. You can find similar resources, messages, and articles at lifetime.org. We have a wealth of information on marriage, parenting, depression, overeating, freedom and identity in Christ, as well as men's and women's issues. You'll find a complete catalog at lifetime.org. Two quick reminders before we conclude. Feel free to share this MP3 with others, especially those you know who might need it. Do so with our encouragement and blessing. And we would sincerely appreciate your financial assistance in making the ministry available to more people. Just go to lifetime.org and you'll find a secure way to support Lifetime Guarantee on the homepage. And finally, We pray God's blessings for you.